In the pantheon of sports entertainment, the 1990s stand tall as a golden era of professional wrestling, a decade marked by unprecedented growth, fierce competition, and the birth of iconic legends. As we journey back through the 1990s, we find a wrestling landscape that was reshaped, not just through physical battles inside of the ring, but through the behind-the-scenes corporate duels that defined a generation. In this video, we revisit this formidable era, beginning with the promotions that served as the battleground for these epic showdowns. In the early 90s, the WWF bid farewell to the golden era icons like Hulk Hogan and embraced a new generation of superstars such as Bret the Hitman Hart and Shawn Michaels. Their storytelling evolved, shifting towards more mature and edgier narratives. The onset of the Attitude Era in the latter half of the decade introduced us to legends like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock, who would define wrestling for years to come. Simultaneously, WCW was rising to power, igniting the Monday Night Wars, a rating battle that saw WCW even overtaking their long-term rivals in WWF for an extended period of time. WCW ushered in the New World Order, an innovation that blurred the lines between storyline and reality forever changing the way that wrestling narratives were crafted. While the 90s showcased wrestling's male superstars, it was also a pivotal period for women in the industry. Names like Alundra Blaze and later Sable and China stepped into the limelight, breaking barriers and laying a foundation for future generations of female athletes. The 90s were characterised by deep, intricate storylines and unforgettable rivalries. The Undertaker's mystique grew with the introduction of elements like the Hell in the Cell and his iconic WrestleMania streak. Rivalries like Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels narrated stories of passion, betrayal and honour, crafting wrestling lore that is revered to this very day. The decade also saw the heartbreaking real-life tragedy of Owen Hart, a sobering moment that reminded fans and performers alike of the real dangers of the squared circle. The 90s brought wrestling into a global stage, utilising satellite technology and the burgeoning internet to reach fans worldwide. Pay-per-view events became grander and productions more cinematic, painting wrestling as a form of live theatre with a splash of Hollywood glamour. Pro wrestling in the 90s was not just a sports phenomenon, it became a critical part of pop culture. The wrestlers themselves became household names, transcending the ring to dominate screens both big and small, while catchphrases from this era became part of the everyday vernacular. As we close the book on the 1990s, we find an industry transformed, elevated to heights unimaginable at the decade's start. It was an era of legends, of warriors battling not just for titles, but for the very soul of the industry. The 90s bestowed upon us a rich tapestry of narratives, a gallery of iconic heroes and villains, and moments etched into the annals of time, not as mere wrestling stories, but as part of a global folklore. It was a time of growth, innovation, and perhaps most importantly, a time when wrestling captured the imagination and hearts of people all around the world, leaving a legacy that reverberates in the wrestling business to this day. As we revisit this golden era of wrestling, we do so with reverence, honouring the performers, the writers, and the fans who made the 90s a period of pro wrestling history that remains unmatched, a true golden era of professional wrestling. Welcome everyone to the WrestlePod. Subscribe now for more pro wrestling and pop culture content. In 1995, the pro wrestling industry continued its trajectory of transformation and expansion with significant developments and noteworthy rivalries that would lay the groundwork for the second half of the decade. In the WWF, we witnessed the rise of Diesel, who had a prominent run as the WWF champion. Though his reign is often criticised for a lack of draw, it was a significant attempt to showcase a new face at the forefront of the company. Another notable development was the debut of Goldust, a character that pushed the boundaries of gender presentation and introduced a more avant-garde style of character development in the company. Over in WCW, the promotion continued to solidify its roster with the likes of Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair and Randy Savage at the helm. The Dungeon of Doom was one of the most antagonistic groups in the company, frequently clashing with Hulk Hogan throughout the year, creating a series of rather memorable, if not a little bit cringe, storylines. WCW also started to introduce elements of international wrestling by bringing in stars from Mexico, laying the groundwork for the cruiserweight division that would revolutionise wrestling in subsequent years. ECW continued to grow in popularity, 
offering an alternative to the more mainstream promotions with a hardcore, no-nonsense style of wrestling. This promotion nurtured talents like Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and both of whom would become household names in the wrestling industry. On January the 22nd, the 1995 Royal Rumble was particularly memorable for its main event, where Shawn Michaels achieved a first in Royal Rumble history. Entering as the first wrestler, he remarkably outlasted 29 others to claim victory, enduring a gruelling 38 minutes and 41 seconds in the ring. I think that was certainly one of the bigger building blocks. You know, I always sort of go back to that WrestleMania 10 ladder match, which is where it put me on the map from a performance standpoint, to where people thought I might be able to be a pretty okay main event performer at that point. But the Rumble and those appearances obviously then start setting you up for a very tip-top main event, carrying the company type aspect. This event also featured a WWF World Heavyweight Championship bout where reigning champion Diesel faced off against Bret Hart. This match, however, ended in chaos due to the interference of multiple wrestlers, leading to a loss of control by the referee. Other title matches added to the event's excitement. Jeff Jarrett triumphed over Razor Ramon to win the WWF Intercontinental Championship, while the 1-2-3 Kid and Bob Holly emerged victorious in the tournament finale, earning them the WWF Tag Team Championships. The Royal Rumble of 1995 also set the stage for several ongoing storylines that extended into WrestleMania 11. One notable incident involved Bam Bam Bigelow and NFL Hall of Famer Lawrence Taylor, who was in the audience. Bigelow's attack on Taylor paved the way for a showdown at WrestleMania. WCW Super Bowl V took place on February the 19th, 1995, from the Baltimore Arena in Baltimore, Maryland. In the main event, Hulk Hogan successfully defended the World Heavyweight Championship against Vader, as Vader was disqualified due to Ric Flair's interference in the bout. In the penultimate match, Sting and Randy Savage defeated Avalanche and Big Bubba Rogers. Also at the event, Harlem Heat of Booker T and Stevie Ray retained the World Tech Team Championships against the Nasty Boys by disqualification. An infamous match took place at the event, in which Alex Wright defeated Paul Roma, during which Roma kicked out of Wright's pinfall attempt where Roma was supposed to lose. The referee counted the pinfall anyway and awarded the win to Wright. No replay of the fall was ever shown. Roma's lack of cooperation in the match and refusal to lose to Wright led to his dismissal from WCW a month later. On March the 19th, WCW hosted their uncensored pay-per-view event. Highlights included the King of the Road match in a cage trailer on an 18-wheeler, where the goal was to reach the top and honk a horn, won by Blacktop Bully. This pre-recorded match, near Atlanta, faced heavy edits due to WCW's No Blood Rule. Dustin Rhodes and Bully were fired for violating it. In the Boxer vs Wrestling match, Johnny B. Bad defeated Arn Anderson in the fourth round, though Anderson's TV championship wasn't at stake. The event, marketed as Rule Free, saw an odd disqualification. Avalanche lost to Randy Savage after an attack by a disguised Ric Flair. The Nasty Boys and Harlem Heat match, with no tag team titles at stake, turned chaotic in the concession area, featuring impromptu weapons like cotton candy. A subplot involved Hulk Hogan's manager Jimmy Hart being abducted by Vader and Flair, but he escaped to support the Renegade at ringside. During Hogan's non-title match against Vader, interference by Flair and a masked man, later revealed as Randy Savage, ensued, leading to Hogan's victory. The first masked man was unmasked as Alan Anderson, tied up by Savage. I'm not one of your punk students. I'm the face of death. Boy Meets World was about as popular as it's possible to get for a kids' television show in the 1990s, coinciding with arguably the most popular time in pro wrestling's history. It was no coincidence then that these two much-beloved forms of entertainment's paths would collide. The storyline of Boy Meets World would often play out as the title implies, with each week the protagonist Corey coming up against and overcoming unsurmountable odds. One such instance saw Corey entered into his high school wrestling team, only to have to fight for his place on the squad against his class bully, Francis Stecchino Jr. 
When Corey and his opponent arrive at the ring for their match, it quickly becomes clear that Francis' father is none other than in-universe world wrestling champion, the Mastodon, played by Vader. The imposing big man, challenging long-running antagonist and high school principal Mr. Feeney to a loser leaves town Texas deathmatch, which, due to the way the episode plays out, we never get a chance to see. Give daddy a tag. <laughs> Creator of the show, Michael Jacobs, said on casting the iconic Vader, We wanted a character who is just this loving father who moonlighted as a villainous wrestler. It was this oddball, very funny, very loving, blue-collar relationship. The episode and Vader's appearance proved so popular with fans of both the show and wrestling fanatics that the character was written into two subsequent episodes the first of which saw the Mastodon called into the principal's office and outfitted in a barely sizeable suit. The comedy of the scene coming from the idea that such a big and imposing character was just an ordinary guy outside of the ring, his wife, a tiny quiet woman, only adding to this juxtaposition. His persona on television struck a little fear into the hearts of the kids on the show for about six seconds, said Michael Jacobs, but kids are the first to see right through you. They realised that this was a very good guy, and there was a lot of clowning around. The third appearance of Vader in Boy Meets World is certainly the most widely remembered, and for good reason. For a kid at the time like me, who loved both wrestling and this TV programme, seeing it play out at the time damn near blew my mind. In a match which was filmed with WWE's production team, we see Vader go up against Jake the Snake Robert for a chance at the WWF Championship. The episode was filmed during a real house show, with the cast at ringside to aid Vader in his conquest. Brother Love Bruce Pritchard features as ring announcer and match commentator to really connect the two worlds, and the episode goes off air with a cheesy but heartwarming moment shared between Corey and long-term love to Panga. Overall, a good example of how a crossover between television and pro wrestling can be handled to entertain both sides of the audience. You won this round, but next time, and there will be a next time, Texas Deathmatch, loser, leaves town. WrestleMania 11 took place on April the 2nd at Hartford Civic Center in Connecticut. The event featured seven matches. Key highlights included Jeff Jarrett retaining his WWF Intercontinental Championship against Razor Ramon. Owen Hart with Yokozuna at his side as his surprise partner defeated the Smoking Guns for the WWF Tag Team Championships. The WWF Championship bout saw Shawn Michaels, accompanied by Jenny McCarthy, challenge champion Diesel, escorted by Pamela Anderson. Michaels showcased agility while Diesel displayed strength. Despite executing high-flying moves and a sleeper hold, Michaels couldn't secure a win. Interference from Sid, Michaels' bodyguard, disrupted a potential pinfall. Diesel eventually overpowered Michaels, culminating in a botched jackknife move for the victory. The main event spotlight, ex-NFL star Lawrence Taylor against wrestler Bam Bam Bigelow, a rivalry sparked back at the 1995 Royal Rumble. Taylor's victory led to Bigelow's expulsion from Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation. This matchup garnered significant media attention, with mixed reactions regarding Taylor's wrestling debut and the implications of a football player defeating a seasoned wrestler. Overall, WrestleMania 11 received varied reviews at the time, being labelled as both the worst in its series and a saviour event for the WWE. Following WrestleMania, Karma repurposed The Undertaker's urn into a necklace, sparking a rivalry. The Undertaker first triumphed over Karma in an untelevised match at In Your House 1 and continued his winning streak in a casket match at In Your House 2. Their feud culminated at SummerSlam in 1995, where The Undertaker claimed victory in another match. However, it wasn't until he concluded his conflict with King Mabel, also in a casket match, that The Undertaker reclaimed the remains of his urn. An interesting footnote in The Undertaker's career was the recognition of his impressive WrestleMania streak, which eventually reached 21 consecutive wins. This achievement was first publicly acknowledged during his entrance against King Kong Bundy at WrestleMania, when commentator Vince McMahon noted The Undertaker on his way to the ring, a man who's never lost at WrestleMania. During one harrowing encounter with Terry Funk on April 15, 1995, 
Mick Foley's character Cactus Jack became aware of a sign held by a fan in the front row that read Kane Dewey, a callous message specifically targeting Cactus Jack's young son. Consumed by a mix of rage and indignation, the formidable competitor unleashed a series of impassioned diatribes, deriding the various essence of hardcore wrestling and admonishing the audience for relishing in his personal suffering. These unforgettable moments were later held by Paul Heyman as some of the most exceptional sports entertainment interviews ever captured on television. While all undeniably entertaining, they were rooted in a raw truth. Mick Foley himself admitted, Yeah, but the odd thing is I wasn't immediately angry about the sign. In fact, in fairness to the guy who made it, he actually asked me if it would be okay. But decided to cut the show's now infamous Kane Dewey promo when he saw his wife's reaction as what she saw as wrestling gone too far. I think he showed me the sign a week before he debuted it at the ECW arena. I kind of shrugged and said, yeah, that's fine. It wasn't until I told my wife and she said, I'm sorry, I just got sick to my stomach. You realise somebody is making a sign advocating the physical abuse of a three-year-old child. I thought she had a pretty valid point. It's not a very positive sign for anyone to be carrying. Although this ultra-violent approach had endeared ECW to its hardcore local audience, in order to make the company a success, they needed advertisers and television networks to pay them for their product. With blood, guts and gore on almost every show, this was proving to be difficult for Paul Heyman to arrange. At WrestleMania in 1995, the human thumb King Kong Bundy represented DBRC in a match against The Undertaker, one which saw the giant Bundy slammed off his feet before receiving a jumping clothesline from the dead man and the 1-2-3. Brad Riggins called me and said, Hey, Mr. Inoki is coming to Denver and he would really like to become reacquainted with Muhammad Ali. They had lost touch. There had not been any conversations subsequent to their fight. So they had completely lost touch and I the year before had done some business with Muhammad Ali and become, I don't want to say friends, but friendly. I called Muhammad's wife and said, here's the situation and Antonio Inoki would love to meet Muhammad and here's the dates. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in a hotel room in Denver and Antonio Inoki seeing each other for the first time since that fight. Me being able to make that happen and facilitate that probably went a long way for Antonio Inoki and it was one year later that now I'm on a jet flying to Pyongyang, North Korea, sitting next to Muhammad Ali. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, in 1995, North Korea was struggling to cope with a devastating famine. In order to try and bring eyes to the struggles of the Korean people and some good publicity for the internationally abhorred North Korean government, Eric Bischoff and Antonio Inoki devised a plan to take pro wrestling to Korea. Owing to his close relationship with the Korean Ricky Dozan, Inoki was treated differently to other foreigners in the North and was afforded a level of respect by Korean officials not often put on display. The project started out with the ambitious goal of bringing together the North Korean people and the rest of the world and would turn out to be the largest and most highly attended pro wrestling event of all time. They're the two biggest attended pro wrestling shows ever. They were not the two biggest paid, but they were the two biggest by a huge margin actually every record always broken, but I can't imagine how this one would be. Eric Bischoff brought with him the likes of Ric Flair, Road Warrior Hawk, Scott Norton, Chris Benoit, Two Cold Scorpio and the Steiner Brothers. Anoki similarly brought a host of top Japanese talent to contend with the Americans. However, what started in genuine good faith quickly turned sour as the Korean government sought to control every aspect of the show and the performers' actions whilst inside their strictly regulated country. All of the visitors' transport was arranged for them at precise times, including their flight into North Korea. This thing looked like it flew in World War II, man. It was a mess, old and rickety. It was just a heap. We tried to order a beer and they're all hot. Nothing was refrigerated. The flight was terrible. It was a prop and transport plane, so it was not the most comfortable. For someone like Scott Norton, who weighed close to 360 pounds, it was a little uncomfortable. The quality of the old plane was the first indication that perhaps the rosy idea of North Korea that some of the wrestlers had previously had in their minds may have been false. We went in the airport and they were turning lights on and half of them didn't work. There was dust caked everywhere. Nobody, it seemed, had been through the airport in years. 
The two-day event would go on to be watched live by over 350,000 Koreans, with 190,000 people packed into the stadium on the second day for the main event. On April the 22nd and 29th, 1995, at May Day Stadium in Pyongyang, North Korea, watching news footage and scenes from this event is seriously almost surreal. Far larger than any show WWE has ever put on, the spectacle of the show feels more like the opening ceremony of an Olympics. But this apparent support for pro wrestling in Korea turned out to be far more sinister than any of the wrestlers would have imagined. Me and Ric Flair were taking this crappy limo to the collision in Korea event the first day. I said, Rick, man, we're really drawing, look at this. The driver looked back and said, excuse me, what do you mean by drawing? I answered, that's a term we use when a lot of people are coming to see us. He replied, no, nobody really wants to come. It's forced attendance. If they don't show up, they get a bullet in the head. As the show began, it was apparent that the glamour and grandiose nature of the event was manufactured by force. The Koreans in attendance yawned and fidgeted their way through hours of pro wrestling form of entertainment many of them had never seen and even more had no interest in. The crowd was quiet throughout, with mumbled whispers heard during slow periods of combat. The atmosphere feels more like being forced to attend a funeral for someone you've never met than a display of joy and unity through pro wrestling. The main event was planned to be Antonio Inoki facing off against his old rival in Hulk Hogan. However, Hogan continually denied Eric Bischoff and Inoki's requests stating that he felt North Korea was too dangerous for someone with such a famous face. Bischoff explained that he tried several times to entice Hogan, but was ultimately unsuccessful, stating, Anoki and Hogan had a long history that dated back to the 80s, so it would have been a great thing for Anoki in many respects. But I might have well have asked him to row a boat to Pluto. It was not going to happen. North Korean propaganda has shown American soldiers killing children and shooting down families for generations. The people of North Korea, without access to international news or media, were led to believe that all Americans are violent, loudmouthed, arrogant and sex-crazed, with glowing white hair and glittering blue eyes, who spend all of their money on unnecessarily fancy clothing and gluttonous amounts of drugs and alcohol. So, to prove them wrong, in comes Ric Flair. As he made his way to the ring, the crowd seemed more shocked than entertained by Ric Flair's appearance and mannerisms. Here we are, Mayday Stadium. Can you be more American than Ric Flair? Star-studded robes and his entrance music. If you can imagine that music playing, him marching to the ring. The audience probably had never seen anything like that. Blonde hair, blue eyes, guy wearing a star-studded robe. I would like to know what they thought. The crowd didn't respond to anything that I can remember until Enoki came out there. It certainly wasn't because I was overwhelmingly popular with them. They probably said, who's this guy? But Enoki, he appealed to them. When Inoki made his appearance, it felt like the homegrown hero had returned to claim his throne. This would prove to be the only single time that Ric Flair and Antonio Inoki would face off in the two men's historic careers. The event received few pay-per-view buys from WCW fans back in the US and had been pushed to the back of the WWE catalogue since they purchased the rights to the footage back in 2001. You'd think that with their love for making in-depth documentaries about wrestling's past, WWE would leap at the chance to cover such an unusual and controversial subject that they already own the rights to. However, some people speculate that if WWE did ever make the collision in Korea a topic for public discussion, they would have to admit that their company does not hold the world attendance record for a pro wrestling show. I'm not sure about this angle, to be fair. But I do see that the complex relationship between North Korea and the United States in the years since has probably not pushed WWE closer to tackling this fascinating event. Part of the trip was Anoki's way back into mainstream political awareness in Japan, and he had good relations with certain people within the Japanese government, which helped facilitate this. Antonio Anoki would take the event as an opportunity to further solidify his relationship with the North Korean government, and would visit the country regularly throughout the rest of his life to discuss politics and governance with some of the nation's top officials. When asked about his meeting with Ri Su Yong, Anoki said this of the vice chairman of the North Ruling's Workers' Party of Korea. He told me Pyongyang will continue its nuclear testing and take it to a higher level unless the global community, especially the US, stops applying pressure. The United Nations, Trump and Japan are all saying we need to apply more pressure. First, we need to listen to them and understand what the reasons are behind their activity. Inoki saw himself as a possible link between Korea and the rest of the world as an ambassador for peace, working to convince his fellow Japanese politicians to do the same. 
They have hinted they wanted to visit North Korea eventually, if given the chance, Anoki said of his fellow Japanese politicians. I really think that Japan should take a role as mediator between the US and North Korea. As the only country which was bombed during World War II with nuclear weapons, Japan should be advocating that we should avoid nuclear war from happening again. Antonio Inoki's work in North Korea was immortalised when his likeness was applied to a postage stamp, an honour virtually unheard of for a non-North Korean to receive, which goes some way to show just how respected the Japanese athlete was within the country. However, Inoki's close relationship with the controversial North Korean government has come at a price. Back in Japan, many have been uneasy about Inoki's allies in Korea and have questioned his motives. I'm past 70 now, so I'm prepared to receive the final call, whenever my time comes. In the future, even when I'm not around anymore, I hope that the steady exchange with North Korea will not be extinguished. Not content to simply be the world and tag champion simultaneously while still holding the belt, Silver King formed a temporary alliance with another Lucha star with the Shocker, and the pair entered into and won the Torneo Gran Alternativa in 1995, a highly regarded exhibition featuring some of Mexico's top talents. In early 1995, the WWF introduced the In Your House series, a response to WCW's expansion of their pay-per-view events. These monthly pay-per-views positioned between WWF's major shows were offered at a lower price. This strategy, this strategy aimed to bolster WWF's market presence, compensating for the loss of Saturday night's main event on network TV and a limited revenue from home video sales at the time. Unlike the big five main events, WrestleMania, King of the Ring, SummerSlam, Survivor Series and Royal Rumble, which lasted for three hours, In Your House shows were shorter, lasting two. The inaugural In Your House was held on May 14th, 1995 in Syracuse, New York. It featured Sid challenging Diesel for the WWF Championship. The 1995 King of the Ring, the third instalment of the annual event and the ninth tournament of its kind, occurred on June the 25th at the Core State Spectrum in Philadelphia. This particular event is often remembered by WWE fans for being one of the company's least favourable pay-per-views. The headline match was a tag team showdown featuring WWF champion Diesel and Bam Bam Bigelow against Tatanka and Psycho Sid. Diesel secured the victory for his team by pinning Tatanka. Notable undercard bouts including a Kiss My Foot match between Bret Hart and Jerry Lawler, as well as the King of the Ring tournament final. In this decisive match, Mabel emerged victorious over Savio Vega to claim the tournament's crown. In recent years, Dustin Rhodes has carved out a legacy for himself, known for his longevity in the business and his ability to perform at the highest level, even at his advanced age. In AEW, his character has taken a more serious approach and had faced off against several opponents in classic matchups including a fondly remembered and emotional feud with his younger brother, Cody. However, this hasn't always been the case. After moving around the wrestling world, Dustin returned to WWF in 1995 with a new character, the villain, the bizarre one, Goldust, an effeminate and unusual character who played on the idea of gay panic in the 90s, blowing kisses, groping his male opponents and being sexually suggestive, were all a part of Goldust's tactics to unnerve and distract in order to win victory in his matches. The androgynous nature of the character led to Goldust emulating both male and female wrestlers and celebrities during his matches. One such time, when Goldust was facing off against Two Cold Scorpio, known at the time as Flash Funk on Raw, Goldust came to the ring dressed as a black man, complete with oversized afro, gold chains and a boombox. As the ring announcer calls the character, the artist formerly known as Gold Dust as a reference to the musical artist Prince, commentator Jerry Lawler says, he looks more like the artist formerly known as Shaft, laughing his head off the whole time. The crowd boo and for good reason, this is about as distasteful a blackface as you can get. There's no attempt from Gold Dust to represent a black person, his skin is unnaturally dark and his hands remain unpainted. It is more akin to the look achieved by minstrels in the 1800s, and that's where, in my opinion, these kind of acts should remain. Seemingly, Peacock, the network that now owns the rights to the WWE back catalogue, agrees. Dave Meltzer said, Peacock and WWE are 
evidently editing out segments from the late 90s with gold dust wearing black paint on his face. I love you, Brett. I love you, too. We love you, the best. best. We love the I whole Iron Brett Nation. They rock. They're the best. Like, he sees Sean and it makes him sick because his children are watching. He doesn't want his children exposed. Exactly. Brett speaks the truth. He will always be my hero. He's he always, always my always hero. Our hero. I love him with all my heart. The odd couple of Brett and Sean paired up once again to face off against Jacob and Eli, the Blue Brothers, in a tag match. A twist on the pre-existing formula allowed a chance for these two now well-travelled foes to put aside their differences and show what they can achieve as a unit. On an untelevised dark match, Brett and Sean easily beat the Blue Brothers with little resistance when Hart applied his patented sharpshooter submission. Not a memorable match by any stretch, but notable as one of the lesser seen instances of Hart and Markles both working as somewhat good guys in the ring together. And I still am the best. And I gave that gave the WWF um, 14 years of maybe the greatest wrestling matches in the history of the of the of the business. The next time we'd see the pair in a ring together was when they teamed up to face off against Jerry the King Lawler and Hikushi in an untelevised match. Jerry Lawler got the crowd riled up before the contest got underway, and the match had a great pace. Little was known as to why this match never made its way to television, as during the 10 minute bout, the wrestling on display from Brett and Sean is stellar, and the same can be said for the character work from The King and Hakushi. Brett ends up getting jumped at the bell and is on the receiving end of a serious beating for the majority of the contest. The excitement rises as he tries again and again to make his way towards his partner, Michaels. With Brett staying true to his no cheating rule, he's frustrated when Michaels begins to bend the rules. As Sean gets the hot tag, the crowd erupts as he manages to swing the momentum in the side's favour. The bell rings as Hart forces Hakushi to tap out to the sharpshooter as Brett and Sean reluctantly share in the celebrations of victory. It was around this time that Sean Michaels began to see the light. He had moved away from the more extreme sides of his personality and had become one of the fan favourites inside of WWF, cementing his new stance with his move away from the loss to Diesel and his heel valets, choosing instead to be paired with Jose Lothario, an experienced veteran of the ring. As I was watching the episode of Space Ghost featuring Hulk Hogan for this video, I realised that here's a perfect parallel for the trajectory of Terry Bollea's fame through the years. It was an animated television series that originally aired in 1966, and later saw a revival in the 1990s. See, there is something with this comparison. The original show follows the adventures of Space Ghost, a powerful superhero with a distinctive white suit and cape, who fights villains across the galaxy alongside his companions Jan and Jace, and is beloved across the universe. In the 1990s version, titled Space Ghost Coast to Coast, the character's format was transformed into a satirical talk show, where Space Ghost interviews real-life celebrities and interacts with them in a humorous and often absurd manner. By the time the 90s reimagining of the cartoon aired, Hogan himself had transformed from the superhero of yesteryear, and was now an equally changed format. He had become a mirror held up to the zeitgeist of the era and was focused solely on celebrity and fame. The Space Ghost show's unique blend of superhero action and surreal comedy has made it a cult favourite, showcasing the character's evolution from a traditional crime-fighting hero to a pop culture icon with a postmodern twist, just like the Hulkster himself. However, let's focus on the meat and potatoes of the episode in question, because to be honest, it's like they took all of Hulk's charisma, put it in a blender with a dash of confusion, and hit the utter disaster button. Hulk's performance in this episode was truly something to behold. I mean, I've seen mannequins with more emotional depth. It's like he mistook the studio for a wrestling ring and was waiting for someone to dramatically hit him with a folding chair to kickstart his dialogue. And speaking of dialogue, I'm convinced that when Hulk isn't pumped up on his usual mix of prayers and vitamins, his energy levels just can't reach those iconic highs. Remember that moment when Hulk was supposed to express shock? Yeah, I haven't seen facial contortions that extreme since I tried eating one of JR's $2 steaks. I'm pretty sure his eyebrows leaped off his forehead and tried to escape the set. But hold on, because the animation team deserves its own round of applause. To be honest, the entire cast and crew deserve credit, 
The Space Ghost is both clever, inventive, and quite funny. It's a program that I have hugely fond memories for and I loved when I was a kid. I'm obviously hyper-focused on Hogan and exaggerating my displeasure for both financial gain and to make myself feel better about my unfulfilling life. If I came on here and said, Space Ghost is good, but Hulk Hogan's appearance is rather forgettable, it wouldn't be nearly as fun. The whole series is rather enjoyable, and I found myself binging more than a few episodes. Hogan brought me back to something which I loved as a child, and had me tuning in to an episode of a programme I would never have seen without him. So, once again, we cannot argue that his cameo did exactly what it was intended to do. Like, he sees Sean and it makes him sick because his children are watching. He doesn't want his children exposed. Exactly. Brett speaks the truth. He will always be my hero. He's he always, always my hero. Always our hero. I love him with all my heart. The odd couple of Brett and Sean paired up once again to face off against Jacob and Eli, the Blue Brothers, in a tag match. A twist on the pre-existing formula allowed a chance for these two now well-travelled foes to put aside their differences and show what they can achieve as a unit. On an untelevised dark match, Brett and Sean easily beat the Blue Brothers with little resistance when Hart applied his patented sharpshooter submission. Not a memorable match by any stretch, but notable as one of the lesser seen instances of Hart and Markles both working as somewhat good guys in the ring together. The 1995 SummerSlam event was held on August the 27th at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena in Pennsylvania. Nine matches took place, with several undercard matches gaining notable attention. One of the highlighted matches saw Bret Hart defeating Isaac Yankum by disqualification. The disqualification occurred when Yankum, alongside Jerry Lawler, attacked Hart while he was trapped in a hangman position. Another significant match was a casket match between Karma, managed by Ted DiBiase, and The Undertaker, accompanied by Paul Bearer. In a prominent Intercontinental Championship bout, Shawn Michaels defended his title against Razor Ramon in a ladder match. Michaels successfully retained his championship in this intense clash. The event also featured a World Championship match between King Mabel and Big Daddy Cool Diesel. Mabel was carried to the ring on a platform by a group of indie wrestlers who visibly struggled under his weight. Diesel's entrance was accompanied by a pyrotechnic display with commentary noting the diesel power of the WWF. In August of 1995, Heyman once again displayed his tactical brilliance by reaching out to professional wrestlers who excelled in technical prowess and focused solely on the art of skillful high-flying manoeuvres. This approach had fallen out of favour in mainstream wrestling for a considerable time, making it a risky move for the person in charge especially since the extreme aspect of ECW seemed to overshadow the wrestling aspect. Nonetheless, Heyman's decision proved that ECW was more than just about unbridled brutality. Dimalenko and Eddie Guerrero, two exceptional competitors, left the Philadelphia fans awestruck with their lightning-fast matches, showcasing a unique hybrid style of Mexican and Japanese wrestling never before witnessed in mainstream wrestling in the United States. To fill the void left by their departure, ECW introduced American wrestling fans to exhilarating Mexican luchadors like Rey Mysterio and Psychosis. At the time, these high-flying stars were deemed too small by WCW and WWF. Heyman leveraged his connections to the NWA and WCW, bringing in promising pro wrestlers with untapped potential. Among these impressive younger talents was Steve Austin, who joined Heyman's fold in November of 95. Austin had recently been released by WCW due to an injury, but found solace and opportunity working under his former manager from the Dangerous Alliance days. Given the freedom to express himself fully on television, Austin, a frustrated competitor, unleashed scathing criticisms towards Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair and others. While Austin only competed in two matches during his time in ECW, it was his unforgettable interviews that played a pivotal role in shaping his future persona as Stone Cold. 
Full Brawl once again came around in September. The pre-show for the pay-per-view event was aired on WCW Main Event. During this segment, Eddie Guerrero made his first WCW television appearance facing Alex Wright. The match concluded prematurely when Wright asked referee Nick Patrick to halt the match due to an injury Guerrero sustained. During a trip to Syracuse, New York, Shawn Michaels finished up his match against the British Bulldog and the pair, joined by X-Pac Shawn Waltman, left the show in search of celebration. After one too many drinks, the trio were invited to a local nightclub where they continued to drink and chase after women. Shawn Michaels found himself belligerently drunk, pulling shapes with a group of young women on the nightclub dance floor, one of whom Michaels invited back to his hotel room, only to be met by a rather large local man who intervened. Shawn being the showman he always has been, continued to dance and thrust his way around the club, drawing the ire of a few others and causing friction with the locals. Outside, as Sean attempted to leave, he was met in the car park by the man who had previously accosted him and a few of his equally large friends. One man reportedly shouted, What are you hanging around with those loser wrestlers for? They're all a bunch of fakes. At Sean and the women he was with before the tension began to escalate. With no friends in sight, Sean threw a floppy right hand towards his aggressors to no avail. He was set upon by the now angry group, who sent him away with a concussion and a split lip. The real life event played into the WWF show, as the story was greatly exaggerated and grew to how Michaels had been set upon by an angry mob and valiantly fought till the last. This drew enormous sympathy from the wrestling fans and helped push Michaels further towards the light. WWF pushed the story so far as to have Sean collapse during a promo segment in the ring, really driving home the seriousness of his injuries. WWF In Your House 4 aired in October of 1995. During the third match of the evening, WWF Tag Team Champions The Smoking Guns successfully defended their title against the 1-2-3 Kid and Razor Ramon. The Kid and Ramon struggled to function as a unified team, leading to their defeat. Post-match in a significant plot development, the 123 Kid betrayed Razor Ramon, escalating their ongoing story. The fourth match of the evening marked the live debut of Gold Dust in WWF, a character previously introduced through pre-recorded segments. Gold Dust emerged victorious against Marty Gennetti. The main event featured Diesel facing off against the British Bulldog, with Bret Hart joining the commentary team. This was simply to emphasise Hart's position as the next contender for the belt. The match concluded controversially when Hart interfered, striking the British Bulldog and causing Diesel to be disqualified. Although Diesel lost the match, he retained the title. The event concluded with Diesel retaliating against Hart for his interference. The 1995 Survivor Series was a significant event, held on November the 19th at the USA Air Arena in Landover, Maryland. Notably, it was the first Survivor Series to occur on a Sunday night, breaking the tradition of always being scheduled on Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving Eve. The main event was a high-stakes no-disqualification match for the WWF World Heavyweight Championship, pitting Diesel against Bret Hart. Hart emerged victorious, claiming his third championship title and concluding Diesel's notable 358-day reign, the longest of the 1990s. Whenever people would ask what the BSK was, I would say... If I told you, I'd have to kill you. On screen, The Undertaker has been part of many different teams and factions over the course of his illustrious career. From tag team partnerships with his kayfabe brother Kane, to his leading role as the head of the Ministry of Darkness, and even aligning with the McMahons to create the supergroup, the Corporate Ministry. Behind the scenes, however, the Undertaker led a different kind of faction. Born out of the need to stop the overwhelming domination in the locker room, brought by the rival group, The Click. Throughout the mid-90s, The Click had assumed a lot of control over the creative storylines and how matches were won. With Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Triple H, Scott Hall and Shawn Walkman banding together to give themselves more negotiating power. Other wrestlers in the locker room felt pressured by The Click and decided that they couldn't continue to run unopposed. In 1993, The Undertaker, a man who had demanded respect amongst his peers since the early days of his career, pulled his closest allies in the business even closer, 
and through a love of playing dominoes with one of the oddest combinations of WWF wrestlers you'll ever likely see, BSK was born. To understand deeper about the formation of this mysterious collaboration, I want to dive into some quotes from the men who were there at the time, riding on the road, and see what they have to say. Everybody thinks that The Undertaker started the BSK, but it was actually Yoko. Yoko was always the mouthpiece at the time. It stood for the Bone Street crew. Myself, The Undertaker, Yokozuna, Rikishi, Savio Vega, Brian Adams, Paul Bearer and Papa Shango. Then Midian came up a year later and joined too. Me and The Undertaker were friends before. I didn't know any of the other guys except from what I saw them on TV. I met them all in WWE, we were just a bunch of guys with similar personalities. When I arrived to the group, they had been there for a year or two, and knowing Yoko Zuna and Kishi, I was accepted. I worked against The Undertaker one night on Monday Night Raw. We beat the stuff out of each other, after that night he took me under his wing, I started riding with Paul Bear and him. Then my partner came up, and me, him, Paul and Taker were together all the time. I was already friends with a lot of the guys, I was the last inductee into the BSK. You had to have Undertaker and Yokozuna discuss if you could be in, no pressure. Fuji was with us too, we called him Uncle. These men banded together, not only for functional reasons, I mean they travelled together, lodged together, ate together, everything. The men who were drawn together because of business soon realised that they had a lot more in common. As they sat discussing their last matches and how each of them could improve over a beer or ten, the men created a lasting bond which all of them talk of fondly to this day. The age-old tabletop game of dominoes can trace its lineage back to the earliest games that humans ever played with something created for the pure reasoning of entertainment and fun. The domino pieces were originally simple stones with scratch symbols to indicate different values of each rock. As the game evolved and mankind's ability to create became more sophisticated, people began to carve animal bones into pieces which resemble an early form of the modern day domino. The rich elite were afforded more luxurious forms of the early domino game, with fine stones being inlaid with pieces of animal bone and ivory from tusks. This is where we derive the modern day term for dominoes, bones. Apart from their shared passion for the wrestling business, the members of BSK and WWF shared other hobbies, the main one being playing dominoes into the early hours of the morning on long journeys and often accompanied by a swig or two of Jack Daniels. We were a bunch of guys that hung out together, rode together, listening to the same type of music, did the same things at night, and we played dominoes. Yoko would talk like a gangster, one time he said, BSK, Bone Street crew in the house. That was Yoko starting it. Like any sane group of 30 to 50 year old work colleagues would do, and in one of the most pro wrestling y things ever, the members of the Bone Street crew went out and got tattoos, marking their lifelong allegiance to the group. Much like the clique, they were just guys who hung out with each other. At some point, after guys had stirred up the locker room about the clique, all of those guys got BSK tattoos. I got interested in tattoos. On the right arm, I have a couple of things, like a spider and a web. I said to the guys, on this side, I want you to put BSK. I arrived at the arena and I said, okay, I got my tattoo, I want to see more. I was like, man, we've all got to get these tattoos. We've all had tattoos anyway. I have this demon on my back. He's got really big hands and across his knuckles it says BSK, it's really cool. You had to come up with your own thing. Mine is on the leg and it's in a design that says BSK. I got two, I got a dagger on my arm, a couple of years later I got the letters on my neck. Obviously The Undertaker has the biggest one, he always takes his singlet off at the end of a match and when he does BAM there's the tattoo. Undertaker got it tattooed on his belly big time, Yoko said he was going to have a small one on his arm, Rikishi never did, but I was the first one to have the BSK tattooed on me. Everyone has their own valid opinions about tattoos and this kind of male bonding in the fraternity sense. Members of the rival group The Click, especially Triple H, have been pretty outspoken about their opposition to the idea of these kind of tattoos, even going as far as to call it embarrassing. But 
It's of nobody's business but those in the BSK who decided all those years ago to sear these iconic letters into their skin forever. It's funny, it was so long ago. I talked to Rikishi a couple of days ago and it seemed like everybody has a different feel for what BSK was. As of 2020, five members of the BSK have been selected for a place in the WWE Hall of Fame. Mr. Fuji, Yokozuna, Paul Bearer, Rikishi and The Godfather all taking their rightful place amongst this legendary record of the industry's greatest performers. Surely it's only a matter of time before the number becomes six with the induction of The Undertaker. The guarded nature of the BSK members and their unwillingness to allow insiders into their business means that as we look back into wrestling history, this ragtag group of men perhaps don't stand out as much as the clique or the stampede guys like the Hearts. The rest of the locker room never found out what it meant. You're not going to ask, because they're not going to tell you. Nobody was willing to ask. But their simple existence meant that they were able to put a limit on the powers of others within the pro wrestling industry, for better or for worse. Either way, behind the scenes, the BSK had a huge impact on the whole of pro wrestling. Outstanding job, Joni. Come join me over here. You are in incredible shape. Have you competed before? <sighs> During her time living with her biological father, her stepbrothers were extremely enthusiastic about working out in the gym and started to encourage their younger sister to do the same. Since the time I was 15 years old, I started lifting weights, watching my brother and his friends, and mostly men who were very supportive, egging me on to lift more weight every day and who really made me feel proud and cool. In 1995, Joni began to see the physical changes driven by her hard work and felt as if she was once again taking control back over her own life. I think I was given a genetic gift to be 5 foot 10 and to have a big frame. I took that to a different level and developed the body of an elite female athlete. I put that at the forefront so people can really relate to that because maybe there are other women out there that want to look like I do but they're ridiculed or they're told that it's not okay or what society deems is beautiful or you should starve yourself and look like a beanpole with fake breasts because that's the only thing that's going to get you looked at. It's not true. Joni is 25 years old and stands 5 foot 10 inches tall and all muscle. She weighs 150 pounds. Some may call him the least successful WWE heavyweight champion of all time. In 1995, however, Pro Wrestling Illustrated named Diesel as their wrestler of the year, whilst the Observer Newsletter made Misawa their main man for 95. The All Japan star receiving accolades for a year of hard work, as the publication also named Misawa in their tag team of the year alongside Kenta Kobayashi. PWI, however, named their tag team of the year as Harlem Heat with brothers Booker T and Stevie Ray. ECW's World Heavyweight Champion at the end of 1995 was the Sandman, having only held it a month since December to dismember. An even more recent champion in ECW was Mikey Whipwreck, who won the company's television title on December the 29th for Holiday Hell. At this event, Mikey Whipwreck not only won the television title, but in the same match, claimed the ECW tag belts alongside Mick Foley, the pair starting 1996 as the ECW Tag Team Champions. Kaiji Muto was New Japan's top champion at the end of the year, holding the IWGP heavyweight belt since wrestling Don Taku back in May. Ric Flair had recently reclaimed the WCW World Heavyweight belt at Starcade on December the 27th. At the same event, One Man Gang had captured the WCW United States Championship, ending the year as holder of the company's second most important title. Johnny B. Bad was the television champion at year's end, having claimed the belt at Halloween Havoc in October, and WCW's tag champions at this time were Harlem Heat, who by this point were becoming prolific in their endeavours to capture the WCW tag belts as many times as possible. WWF's World Heavyweight Champion at the end of 1995 was Bret Hart, who held onto the strap since November's Survivor Series. The WWF Intercontinental Champion for the second time this year was Razor Ramon, who would head into 1996 with that glorious white belt around his waist. As a year of setting stages, 1995 nurtured burgeoning talents and fostered the evolving narrative, with each promotion weaving stories that aimed to captivate audiences and set the wrestling world abuzz. It was a year of significant transformation, setting the stage for the explosive wrestling phenomena that would captivate audiences in the latter half of the 90s. 